sometimes these things happen. So it is my pleasure Technology. and my honor to, to introduce to you uh, Diego Rodriguez, who is going to be the session convener for this morning's session. And uh, uh, Diego is the senior economist in the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And we already made a little bit of a presentation yeah. in the recap about what is going on today, so I just give you the floor. Okay. So. Thanks, Josefina. Sorry for the uh, hiccup. Uh, good morning, to everyone. Uh, we're going to start. I think this is the first uh, sort of full session of the, of the conference. Uh, yesterday we had, a, you know, quite a lot of uh, discussions and interesting presentations, more at the general level. Um, we, we also made the case that there was a, an important um, new step in, in this process of, uh, you know, we've been in dialogues on this water and energy now for two, three years, and uh, for us, at least from the water perspective, it's time to to try and, and, and make sure that we make a good business case for this, for this and to ensure also that uh, we have the capacity to really implement uh, a lot of these principles on, uh, on planning frameworks and also on, uh, when we make uh, investment uh, decisions. So, so we made, uh, uh, I think, I hope, a, a good effort to put together this session that has a, a quite an interesting combination of things. You know? so, I'm going to go through a little bit on what are the main key questions that we are trying to tackle in these sessions and what are sort of the expected outcomes. Uh, we have a, a great group of panelists that I hope you enjoy. Many of them come from the energy sector, so we hope we can learn from them uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, just to recap from uh, one of our presentations yesterday, we discussed that there were, there were many and an array of different solutions that could be implemented when we look at the water and energy linkages. Um, and of course, you know, many of you have heard of, you know, of a, a variety of these in different reports. But then the question is how do we go to the implementation stage or how do we design a planning framework that adequately uh, addresses the potential water constraints um, and, and that we ensure that we can implement these solutions in a financially sustainable uh, manner as well. So, and this is precisely what we're trying to, to tackle with, um, with this session. And for us, of course, we lear we've learned in the last couple of years the importance of uh, establishing very strong partnerships. Uh, you know, the, the energy and water challenges are very, very important, very difficult, very complex. And it's not something that we can tackle in isolation, you know, as, a, as an institution. Uh, I mean, the World Bank alone cannot do much. And, and for us, <clears throat> that's why we have decided to partner with uh, many other development banks, uh, uh, energy utilities. We have uh, here a few around the table that are part of our initiative, you know, Avengoa, EDF. We have Alstom, we have, uh, you know, uh, Mike Hightower here from the National Labs have provided uh, great support the last couple of years. We're in discussions with Shell. Uh, and this is the type of partnership that requires uh, to be established in order to fully address these uh, issues. No? Uh, of course, governments need uh, technological and business partners, particularly to try and improve uh, the, the policy making processes. Uh, so when you, when you talk to a lot of the, our client uh, governments in the south, the developing countries, you see that they are not very well prepared to, to address these complex issues. It's obviously extremely important that um, we involve major key st stakeholders in each part of the uh, process so when we go to countries and we start uh, debating on, this, on these issues, we try to make sure that we make, uh, we make sure that the key stakeholders from the public sector, from, from the private sector, are around the table with us, and we all agree on a common set of uh, messages and processes. And, and obviously the fostering interdisciplinary collaboration between energy and water sectors is key. Uh, and that's what uh, we have, uh, we'll hear from uh, Adrian, for example, the, the work that we are starting in South Africa. These are multidisciplinary teams that are in place, and they are very large teams. Uh, on the South Africa side, I think we have like uh, f five or seven specialists, from energy modelers to, uh, you know, energy policy experts to technology experts, economists, hydrologists, and that's what it takes to tackle these uh, problems. <clears throat> 
So we prepare this, this session with, with the aim of trying to see how we can strengthen these partnerships. What does it take to partner with, a, with the private sector? How, how do you ensure that the governments uh, adopt some of these uh, uh, processes and approaches that we are developing? Um, to demonstrate a bit that, you know, we talk a lot about integrated water management, but here we are really talking on how do you integrate the, the energy and the water planning processes and dimensions. No? We're going to share a bit of the, of the um, ongoing work that we have uh, in the case for, of South Africa as part of this uh, Thirsty Energy Initiative, just to illustrate a bit the, the thinking behind uh, implementing some of these principles. So we have a series of questions that we would like to address uh, throughout the morning. You know, in particular, what are some of these tools and frameworks developed? So we're going to hear a bit of what are the type of um, uh, methods and models that can be used uh, to tackle these issues. Uh, why or how do water constraints drive uh, policies, planning, and investments? So this is something that we hope to hear also from uh, from Avengoa and a bit on the, also from the framework uh, that EDF is um, implementing now, uh, a global uh, initiative. What are these opportunities and challenges to collaborate? How difficult it is to, to really engage the private sector or to really engage the energy sector in these efforts? Uh, how do you make the business case for this? How do you ensure that they, they sit on the table and collaborate as true partners and not just react to things that we prepare? Um, and, and why, why are these partnerships so important? We're going to have basically three, uh, breaking three different groups. Uh, in the morning, we're going to start with, um, with, with the technical considerations. And then we have three very interesting presentations. Ana uh, Delgado, that works uh, with us in the bank on this Thirsty Energy Initiative. And uh, for me, she's a true uh, example of a water and energy specialist because she has a, a strong background in water and then she did a, a graduate work in, in energy technologies. And we're going to try and, and clarify some of these misconceptions or the, the big um, numbers that are out there, the global numbers, and how in, in many cases they can be misleading. Uh, how some of the statements that we read can also be misleading. It is not properly addressed in, uh, within a, a certain context. Uh, then Mike Hightower, who works in the um, Sandia Labs in, in New Mexico, and he has been doing pioneering work in the water and energy as part of the coordinator of the Water and Energy Initiative now for 10 years in the state, will provide some, uh, you know, uh, some understanding of how this initiative works, the difficulties to work with uh, federal and state governments, Tell us a bit about uh, his experience, you know, as in the United States, in a federal state, of 10 years of work in this. And then Adrian uh, Stone, who works with, at the University of Cape Town and is, is working with us on uh, the implementation process of the water and energy nexus in South Africa, will explain a bit how are we tackling the, the problem in South Africa, but also illustrate a bit also the complexities of using some of these energy to tools to in properly incorporate the water considerations. Um, then we're going to have um, a, a break, and, and then we move into understanding, you know, what drives the private sector to, to look at uh, water and water stresses. You know? So we have a very good uh, group of people, you know, Laurent Bellet from, uh, from Electricité de France. They've been leading a, a very interesting um, framework initiative, the Water for Energy Framework, and uh, we are now part of it as well. And I think it will address some of the issues that were raised yesterday, particularly with the, the whole issue of what metrics do you use to measure this, how do you harmonize, harmonize some of these uh, uh, metrics, uh, what are the main issues with the data constraints, and how do you try and tackle those, uh, those issues, what kind of indicators you can use. So there is, there is a very large global effort to try and, and come up with some of the, the answers to this. Uh, much of it will be presented at the forum in, in, uh, in Korea next year, but Laurent will illustrate what is this type of uh, effort. And finally, if we have uh, Paula Darbe from, 
Avengoa, who is also Avengoa is one of our key partners in the initiative, to tell us a bit, uh, you know, how do, how do they address the issue of uh, water scarcity uh, in their own energy projects, particularly renewable energies. They have tremendous experience in uh, in northern Africa in very scarce areas. Uh, they are really pushing sort of the technology boundaries to come up with uh, new solutions, uh, and we're going to hear from uh, Paul on this. Finally, we, we move to, you know, so, so we go from the technical solutions to what the private sector does, and the final uh, section is primarily on the, on the government side. So what the, uh, how, how do governments address these issues? What are the incentives that they require to, to address them? How, how do governments ensure the sustainable development and the discussion of the water and energy that goes way beyond the sectors that we mentioned this, uh, yesterday? Uh, and why is this a, an important issue and how, how partnerships are important to, to strengthen the government's uh, capacities? And there we have uh, also uh, two presentations, from, uh, one from Anuka Liponen from uh, UNECE. And, and she's going to present a very interesting pilot uh, case that they are uh, working on. And this is a, a, a good case because it's on transboundary. So we address a lot of these things on, at the national level, but we know that uh, there are trade issues, particularly on the energy side. You know, water and transboundary level is quite complex to address. And UNEC is doing quite uh, interesting work on this. Then Kelly Krich from uh, Crick from Chris, Chris, from uh, the Department of State in the U.S. Uh, will also explain a bit how they've been incorporating the, the, the Nexus thinking in the U.S. government. Uh, finally, I think Alexander will, from the Dutch government, will say a few words also on how they are restructuring the, the, the government and the ministry to address some of these complex issues. Um, so... With that, I would like to invite Ana Delgado to the first uh, presentation. Okay, hi everyone, buenos dias, good morning. Uh, so what I'm trying to do in this short presentation is to really explain why water is needed in the power sector. As we saw yesterday, we need policymakers in order to make decisions, they really need good data, they really need to understand uh, well why the, water, the energy sector requires water. And now that it's this, the water energy nexus is a hot topic, what we see is in many reports and papers, they throw a lot of numbers, uh, but they never explain why those, there are huge ranges, why those numbers. A lot of the times it's aggregate data from different reports, and they don't even, like, sometimes they don't validate the data, they just aggregate it, and that's why you get these huge ranges. So for me, this graph, if you give it to a policymaker, is not very useful to make decisions because the ranges are huge. So what I'm trying to, to do in this presentation is to explain a little bit why, why there are those ranges. Uh, as we know from yesterday, almost all forms of electricity require water. Uh, for hydropower, it's, it's very controversial and a little, a little bit complex because it really depends on the size of the reservoir, the climate, and most of the data that's available, therefore, it's looking at thermal power plants, which includes all the power plants in there. And I guess it, this makes sense because thermal power plants actually account for about 80% of the global electricity generation. So it's, I think it's very important to understand where those power plants require water. <coughs> so what drives water use in thermal power plants? I, uh, through this presentation, I will try to explain that for me it really depends on mainly two things. Only the type of cooling system that is being used in the power plant and the efficiency of the power plant, not that much the type of the power plant. And there are other small um, factors of, such as climate conditions and other processes, but those are, are minor factors. 
so how do, how do thermal power plants work? And I apologize for the, if there are energy experts in the room that will know this uh, very well. But uh, I really thought it was important to explain. So thermal power plants really uh, use the fuel, be it coal, gas, uranium, solar, energy, biomass, to heat the water and convert it into steam. Then the steam uh, turns the turbines, generate electricity, and the steam needs to be condensated, cooled down, to be converted into water again and close the steam cycle and start again. And this, the, steam, the steam is condensed uh, through the cooling system. Uh, so essentially, if we look at the second graph down there, which is the, the heat balance of the power plant, what happens is like for most of the heat that goes uh, into the power plant, some of it is used to generate electricity, which is the yellow arrow in there. But uh, the, most of it is waste heat, and this waste heat needs to be rejected somehow to the environment, and the vast majority of it gets rejected through the cooling system, which is the blue arrow in the graph. Uh, so if we look at this graph, what it means is that the more efficient the power plant is, the less heat losses, so the, the yellow arrow would be, would be bigger and the blue arrow would be uh, smaller, therefore the less cooling needs that that power plant has. So here I put up some examples of um, efficiencies of power plants, and as you can see, more efficient power plants such as natural gas combined cycle will, require, will have less cooling needs than, for example, nuclear. Um, however, it, does, it, doesn't, it doesn't depend only on the type of power plant, it also depends on the age of the power plant. So older power plants uh, are, very, are, are not very efficient and therefore will require much more water. So it's those old power plants that are a problem. Uh, for example, here I've put uh, two graphs to um, explain it. So here I've put a coal power plant with an efficiency of 36% compared with a coal power plant with an efficiency of 28%. In this case, it's because this power plant has um, carbon capture and storage, but it could be also a power plant that it's old and it has, the, it has the same efficiency as this one. And as you can see, the blue arrow in the second power plant is much bigger, which means that it will, it will have much higher uh, cooling needs. And to dissipate all that waste heat into the environment, uh, as I said, we, uh, we require a cooling system. And there are mainly three types of cooling systems, ones through cooling, cooling towers, dry cooling. There are also the um, hybrid cooling systems, which are between the dry cooling and cooling towers. But to simplify, um, let's look into these three. Uh, in ones through cooling, we require, uh, ones through cooling systems withdraw a huge amounts of water, the water just goes once through the steam condenser, it condenses the steam and it gets returned uh, to the water source uh, a couple of seconds later, um, but some degrees warmer. Uh, so in this type of cooling system, as I said, we require a lot of water withdrawals, but n almost none of the water gets consumed. Uh, depending, well, some reports and some studies say that some of the water, because it, it gets um, back to the water source some degrees warmer, depending on the climate, uh, gets evaporated, but that's outside of the plant, so it's not inside the, the power plant. Then in cooling towers, it's a re recirculating system, so therefore we require less water withdrawals, but most of the water withdrawn is consumed through, um, through evaporation. Um, and then finally, we have dry cooling, which uses uh, air as the ex heat exchanger and therefore requires uh, no water. But as we also said yesterday, there are huge trade-offs depending on which cooling system that we use. Uh, so dry cooling requires no water, but it's more expensive and affects the efficiency of the power plant. For example, cooling towers withdraw less amount of water but consumes more. Uh, so there's really, in my opinion, there's not a good there's not the best cooling system. It will really depend on your conditions and what's your water availability in the region. <clears throat> so now I guess with what I've explained, then this really, you can really understand those graphs here. Uh, the number that, this is like the water withdrawal and consumption for the US. <clears throat> and the number that gets always used is the 39%, uh, which is huge if you compare it to irrigation. 
but then if you look at the water consumption, it's very small, the amount of water you, uh, consumed by the power sector. And this is mainly because in the U.S. there are still a lot of old power plants, and a lot of them still use once through cooling, which means that they withdraw a lot of water, but then they don't consume almost any of it. And to go further into this consumption withdrawal difference, um, I put here an example uh, because a lot of people is very, wor very worried about this 40% of, of um, withdrawals by the power sector. Uh, so there's a lot of talk in the U.S. of essentially banning once through cooling. Uh, so here I've done like some small calculations, it's like very rough estimates, but here this shows you what it would happen. So uh, we will have the retirement of less efficient and older power plants that cannot afford to shift to uh, cooling towers. The cost of electricity could increase because of that. And then the water withdrawal consumption totals would really change in the country. So as we see, the water withdrawals would uh, drastically drop, uh, but then water consumption would increase maybe twice, three times. Um, so is this a good solution? I don't know. It really depends on what's your situation in your state, how much water do you have, uh, where are your climate conditions, and, and that's why I think it's good to know. Like There's huge trade-offs, and you have to decide what you prefer to have um, higher water withdrawals or higher water consumption. Um, and then to stop here with the technical blast uh, and to be accurate, you actually you also need water in other processes than cooling systems, but compared to the cooling water needs, those amounts are very small, and they, also, they only become relevant when you're using dry cooling. Then it's when maybe the flue gases authorization system water needs will be important if you are in a place that it's water, water scarce. So going back to this graph, uh, which has huge ranges, if you actually plot and the water withdrawal versus the heat rate or uh, the efficiency, uh, you, you at least can see a pattern and can understand what's going on instead of seeing a huge range. Um, so here what we can, we can conclude from this graph is that actually the water, we, the water needs of a power plant really depend uh, on the heat rate of the power plant or the efficiency and that most of the water is, is used for cooling purposes. So I think that graphs like these that explain a little bit better the data are more useful for policymakers than just giving huge ranges for the same type of uh, power plants. And here I wanted to end with some of the misleading quotes that we find in articles and reports. I know that this issue is very complicated to explain and it's sometimes by simplifying we state things that can be misleading to the reader that doesn't know enough about the topic. So for example here, as much as I love renewables, just say, and this is like an article from Forbes, just saying that wet cool concentrated solar power plants use slightly more water than cool and natural gas, but they can use dry cooling therefore reducing water demand by more than 90%. Well, that's true, but it's also true for coal and gas. So if you use dry cooling in coal and gas, you will also have uh, very low water, uh, water requirements. So I think that that graph just using uh, dry cooling with, with, for solar thermal is not very fair because you're comparing, like if some people see that, they will think, well, then solar thermal is very good, but if you would do the same for coal and gas, then you will also have in there about 20 gallons. Um, and then another statement there, uh, just comparing hydro water use with concentrated solar, pan, uh, solar plant water use. Uh, I think here they are comparing the water that you uh, release from hydropower, which is not really consumed, it can be used downstream, with the water consumed by a concentrated solar uh, power plant uh, in the cooling towers, which is very different. So you're comparing pears with oranges, which does, is, not really, <laughs> is not really fair either. Uh, here are some more statements. So um, the same again, say, uh, st just stating that concentrated solar power consumes our quant large quantities of water. Well, as we've seen, it depends. If you have dry cooling system, maybe then it doesn't require large quantities of water. Or just saying that uh, CSP consumes more than coal, than gas, and than nuclear. Well, again, it depends if CSP is using dry and it depends on the cooling system used, and it also, if you compare CSP with older power plants, 
that are much less efficient than CSP, then uh, CSP required less water than coal, for example. Um, and then, for example, so our water in intensive nuclear power stations would be replaced by renewables and natural gas, which consume less water. Again, it depends. If those nuclear power stations are using once through, which usually they do, they are withdrawing huge amounts of water, but they are consuming almost none. And if you replace it by natural gas and renewables using cooling towers, maybe you will consume more. You have to really look at the numbers and understand. And so this is my final slide, some of the key takeaway points. Um, so most of the power in the world is still generated by thermal power plants, and that's why I think it's very important that we all understand and policymakers understand what are the water requirements of those power plants. In those power plants, as I've said, uh, the water use is really dominated by the cooling requirements, requirements and the amount of water required for cooling uh, will really depend on the, on the cooling system used. And given the same type of cooling system, as I said, the, it will depend then on the thermal efficiency of the power plant. <coughs> and given the range of the efficiencies within the same type of power plant, as I said, old versus new, it is almost impossible to give a number. So I would ask you when you read an article and, and it says like coal power plants require X liters per megawatt hour that you question that number. What does it mean? Does it, are they saying for new power plants, uh, which is the type of the cooling system they're talking about? So really try to understand that number because it's very difficult just to give a number for a type of power plant. Um, then that some low carbon thermal generation technologies, as I said, since they are less efficient, can, can be at risk uh, regarding water use, but then they can shift to dry cooling, which is more expensive. So there are solutions and there are options. Uh, and finally, I want to end up saying that the water energy nexus is really a regional problem. And it's just because now it's a hot topic, it doesn't mean it's a problem for everyone in the world. So there will be places where there's enough water, where it makes sense to have ones through and withdraw huge amounts of water. Uh, so we really need context-specific solutions because one solution does really not fit all. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for um, putting this a, a bit in, in context. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we start uh, looking at some of these uh, statements and uh, really understand what, uh, what is uh, underlying assumptions and uh, the, understand that when we go to a particular region in a country or a particular planning exercise or we start looking at investments, there are a lot of it depends no? when we start uh, drafting or, or, or formulating these plans. Uh, we have a few minutes for a, a couple of questions. If anybody from the audience has any questions? No? Okay, so then it's very clear. Oh, no. For a very good presentation, especially uh, bringing out uh, the huge uh, variations we see in the data. Uh, just to buttress uh, some of the things you raised, uh, for, the, um, for the amount of water needed um, in, in, in the, in, for various technologies for cooling, the source of fuel also is, is quite important, apart from the efficiency and the type of uh, power plant. Mm. And I think you brought that later on in, in, with some examples. And also, what I missed was the use of cell and water. So once two systems can be, uh, withdraw a lot of water, but if they are located along the coast and they are taking cell and water, then there is no competition for yeah. fresh water. And in the U.S., <coughs> I think my knowledge is what the, the, the shift from one through to uh, the other types of technologies is what's the water quality challenge. So um, discharging hot water and environmental problems are not much to do with uh, the challenges of, of, of using fresh water. I think, yeah, that's all I have. Jack, there's a question there. Yeah. I'd just like to build on that last remark from uh, For some time, we've 
identified very clearly that heat is a pollutant and people need to think of heat as a pollutant, certainly in the freshwater environment, but actually also in the saline environment as well. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I didn't have that in the presentation because I haven't looked at the water pollution. I've only tried to explain why water is needed in the power sector, but yeah, one of the reasons why in the U.S. they wanted to move towards uh, cooling towers and kind of ban once through cooling, it was because of that, of the environmental issues of withdrawing huge amounts of water. First of all, you kill a lot of fishes when you withdraw water, and then the thermal pollution downstream. So that's one of the re like it's that's why it was like the environmental impact in my little box of trade-offs. It was there. It was in red, the monster cooling system, because the environmental impacts are, are huge compared to the other types of cooling systems. Any other question before we move to the next presentation? Yeah, Laurent. <clears throat> Just a comment uh, with these two uh, comments. Is really to, in the key messages, to not really uh, separate the one through and um, closed loop system. And as it has been said, uh, we have a lot, for instance, in France, a lot of nuclear power plants along the seashore. And it's very important to have this because we use a less fresh water, we use seawater. We have a thermal impact on the water in the sea, but it's very localized and the impact are very weak compared to the impact we can have in a river, for instance. So it is very important because in the US, I know that this debate is a little bit polluted because they try to ban the one through cooling system because it is often in, uh, along the river. But when you have the chance to have a seashore with a nuclear or thermal power plant on the seashore, you can use uh, saline water and it is uh, less impacted. Yeah. And, and I guess that that's the problem of, use, of looking at absolute numbers because when people see the 40% withdraw of water withdrawal by the power sector, they say, wow, this is huge. But then, again, as you say, it's the bends. Like if you're just withdrawing water from the sea, then it doesn't make sense to say we should ban once through cooling. It depends. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks again, Anna. Um, we already said, uh, heard a couple of statements related to the U.S., so I think, Mike, it's good uh, time for, for you to come. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Mark, uh, Mike work, works in the Sandia Lab in New Mexico, and he's coordinating the, the Water and Energy Initiative in the U.S. Uh, we had the, the pleasure of uh, when we were starting to look in the bank at this water and energy nexus, we spent a couple of days with all the energy labs uh, in New Mexico, thanks to, to Mike, and we learned uh, a lot about the subject. He's going to tell us a bit, uh, you know, about the, the evolution and, uh, of this initiative and uh, how the U.S. is tackling these issues. So, Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diego. I'm glad you wore a purple shirt like me. Yeah, we tied, yeah. It's a uniform <laughs> of initiative. It's a Let's see, I, I just maybe ought to mention um, my laboratory. Uh, it is in New Mexico. Um, it is, uh, we're a national security laboratory for the Department of Energy. And the reason I bring that up is, um, if you don't understand Spanish, sandia means watermelon. So uh, I get a lot of, of uh, discussion when I, I give presentations in Mexico about why a guy from a watermelon laboratory is, is, is talking about, about energy. But, um, so we have the, uh, the mountains outside of uh, Albuquerque um, are, are pink granite. And so when the sun sets, it looks like uh, a watermelon. Um, and so it's called the Sandia Mountains, and we got our name from the Sandia Mountains. Um, so I've been uh, working, as I said, uh, energy water issues for about a decade, uh, looking at energy security, because when we were looking uh, in 2001, 2002 on energy development in the United States, uh, we started to see at that time that based upon the trends in power plant types, as uh, Anna did a very good job talking about fuel types, um, directions by the EPA in um, changing cooling tower uh, conditions, changes by a number of states in moving power plants from the coast, trying to move them inland and using, instead of uh, seawater, using freshwater. All of these trends were, were looking at 
driving uh, water consumption in the United States for the energy sector up by a factor of three or four. Um, and in, in the eastern United States, where there's a lot of water, that's not a big issue. In the western United States, that is a big water. Uh, we're very arid. Um, the, the situation we have in New Mexico is very similar to here in Spain, here in Zaragoza. Very, very similar climates. So uh, it was driving what we thought were decisions maybe in the wrong direction and a better dialogue needed to be uh, developed on how to best do regional planning uh, to make sure that water resources, which are a very important thing for long-term one economic growth and uh, sustainable development, could be addressed equally. So I, I, I only have a couple of view graphs. Um, I'm trying to give a high level of, of the activities in the United States. Uh, we've been pushing this initiative for um, slightly uh, less than a decade with our first report that came out in 2007. Uh, so we started the work in about 2005 on this issue. But what I have here is some of the things that we're seeing that are driving the, the discussions uh, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, and internationally. And that really is some of the climate impacts on water availability. Um, so we're seeing tremendous growth uh, in the developing countries on energy development at a time when, in, in many cases, in many regions, the water resources to support that energy development for cooling, for fracking, for uh, other applications um, is being reduced. So I, I have this here just to show, and Anna mentioned that things are regional, but the regions of the world that really are looking at some of the major concerns with water issues and therefore energy development and water need to be closely looked at include uh, you know, the southern U.S., both the southwest and the southeast and northern Mexico, um, southern Europe and, and northern Africa, the Mideast, and uh, India and China in the northern hemisphere. And in the southern hemisphere, countries like Brazil and Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, southern Africa, uh, and Australia, and even parts of Southeast Asia are all um, areas that are going to be impacted um, more importantly from climate variation and climate variability. So these mid-latitude populations belts and some of the large developing countries like India and China, Southeast Asia, Southern Africa, and, and South America really need to look at this. Um, these are the regions that I, I think that the energy water nexus is going to play a big role because that's where you'll see diminished uh, water resources and uh, for their economic development um, a large push for energy um, uh, development and cooling water, other types of water for use in um, not only electric power but uh, uh, biofuels uh, and natural gas development, um, alternative transportation fuels, etc. So let me just give an overview of some of the things that we've, we've done in the United States um, and, and how long it takes for people within a government agency and industry to begin to accept some of the trends that they see and begin to do things about it. Because I, th I think that gives an, an idea of uh, some of the uh, issues that the World Bank and others will have in trying to push an initiative like this forward. I, th I think it's important. I think that the World Bank's uh, recognized some of the concerns, but it does take a while for uh, governments and even industry to pick up on it. What we're seeing in the United States is that the industries actually get it better because there is an economic bottom line for them. The governments, because of some of the issues that were mentioned earlier, um, the way that they do um, policy, the way that they do, uh, uh, and they're set in their uh, silos, if you will, it makes it much more difficult for them to, to be uh, more proactive. So I think looking at this from a business case is a good idea because and using businesses to help drive um, government to think about some of these issues has a very big role to play. 
But the first report that was done on energy and water was uh, published in late in 2006, uh, 2007. It was a report to Congress that, that uh, I helped author. Um, and so when the Department of Energy saw that, they said, uh, this is probably all wrong. This can't be that bad. Um, so it took them a number of years to actually begin to accept some of these uh, consequences and issues. Um, in that period of time, since 2007, we've had the uh, Government Accountability Office in the United States actually write five reports on the connection between energy and water, really investigating the 2007 report and what essentially the GAO has determined is that it is real, that this interaction between energy and water is a significant impact on long-term economic development and needs to be addressed. Um, different areas have different levels of uh, concern, but that it does need to be looked at. The Congressional Research Service uh, in the United States did a similar uh, review and suggested that this is a growing issue in the United States and uh, will have impacts on long-term energy growth and economic development. And then we have seen most recently, and the U.S. Geologic Survey uh, just put out a report a month or so ago that gets to one of the points that Anna had mentioned, and that is they have developed a, a strategy and a direction on how to calculate heat rates, heat loads, water use, water consumption for all the power plants. So it's a nice technical journal. Um, and so even the federal government agencies are beginning now to see that there's a large range in uh, published data and there needs to be one way to calculate um, water consumption. So what they have done, the USGS did a very nice job, spent about two years developing a, a way to calculate that. And it, like I say, it just came out. Um, you can look at the USGS uh, energy water um, report. I can give you um, a link to that if you need it. But I think it's going to be the standard for uh, calculating heat rates for power plants and actually getting by your local region what those water consumption issues are going to be. Um, and we're seeing also then that over the past three years or so that groups have begun to understand the, the complexity of this issue and the need. Uh, we have the academic community in the United States, um, the professional engineering community, um, some private nonprofit organizations, NGOs like the Johnson Foundation, National Geographic, Nature, Forbes, are beginning to see the economic issues and the uh, long-term sustainability concerns in developing joint energy and water policies. So I think what um, we're seeing is that people are beginning to understand it, at least in the U U.S., because we've been talking about it for seven or eight years. I think that this trend is going to accelerate throughout the other regions of the world that um, have these, these impacts with uh, climate change, water availability, and long-term economic growth. Um, but we've already seen uh, internationally groups pick up on the energy water nexus issues, the World Business Council and the World Energy Council. Um, so I, I, th I, I see this accelerating. So I think that these kinds of forums are good to get people to identify how do you move forward, how do you look at the business cases to address some of these issues. Um, I think my last slide here is just to show you where we're going to be in the United States and things to watch in the next year or two on where we're going. Uh, the National Science Foundation just released um, an energy water research roadmap. So our National Science Foundation is um, in the process of developing a research program in the energy water issue. The interesting thing there is it has, it's part technical, but it also has some social uh, um, research directions specifically on um, how to develop policies, uh, how to develop uh, decision support tools on the social side to try and help people develop um, innovative applications for energy water uh, governance. So I, I think if you're in the research community or you have people in the research community in the United States that you want to work with, watch the National Science Foundation. 
Um, the Department of Energy is putting out a research roadmap here in the next month or so on their research. Uh, the program plan that they have is uh, scheduled to, to ramp up uh, in the United States from about $20 million this year to $70 million by 2016, uh, and that's a, supposedly new research dollars. So though, that's a uh, huge, huge, um, I think, statement by the Department of Energy that water and uh, water technologies, water efficiency and electric power generation uh, and other uh, energy systems in the United States, uh, transportation fuels, is going to be a big driver for them. So I think that you want to watch uh, for that roadmap coming out and those research calls because I think that there are opportunities for the private industry to coordinate uh, for other entities like World Bank, Department of State, um, other agencies around the world to, to coordinate uh, research activities. Uh, but the, the groups, I think, that have really jumped on this in the United States, and they see it from an economic standpoint, it's a, a business case for them, is uh, trying to have the private industry get ahead of government in pushing forward some policies of their own. And one that I'd like to bring up is the Electric Power Research Institute has started a, an energy water research program. A couple of things about that. They're actually funding uh, private companies to uh, look at advanced cooling technologies, uh, game-changing uh, advanced cooling technologies, um, hybrid, hybrid cooling so that you can get the benefits of uh, wet cooling when you need it, uh, but you can use uh, dry cooling in, in cold times of the year or wet times of the year we have more water. Uh, ways to quickly do that and reduce the costs um, are important. They've also uh, in implemented a $16 million advanced cooling technology pilot scale demonstration facility in Georgia. Private industry put that money up to build a pilot testing facility to look at new cooling technologies. It's that important uh, in the United States for some of these uh, electric power companies to, to, to develop advanced cooling approaches that they couldn't wait for the federal government that they put their own money up. I think that says uh, worlds about the direction that we see in the United States in, in the fact that the water issues really are uh, driving and impacting uh, electric power generation. Um, they're driving uh, tra alternative transportation fuels, whether that's um, gas shales and hydraulic fracking or irrigated biofuels. The water concerns are driving a lot of the industries to look at alternatives and uh, water, water reuse, water conservation. Uh, oil and gas industry is one that in the, the U.S. is really looking at uh, hydraulic fracking and they have a instituted a research program for, for recycling. And I, if you're not familiar with hydraulic fracking, you might want to become familiar with it because there's a lot of uh, shale reserves and natural gas reserves around the world that people will start looking at. But five years ago when I was working with the oil and gas industry, uh, they used fresh water only. And um, we continued to ask them why they couldn't use recycled water or produced water from oil and gas. Now, in their recycling and reuse, they're uh, using water of uh, 250,000 parts per million TDS, which is almost 10 times saltier than seawater. And they're trying to move away from using fresh water for fracking. It, it, some of the, the companies, the private companies, have, uh, like the Schlumbergers and the Halliburtons that do fracking, um, have really looked at minimizing the use of fresh water. It's, that's a good trend. And there's a lot of push within the industry to move that forward because of the political issues associated with it, as well as the technical issues with disposal, reuse, et cetera. So I think that we're seeing private industry really getting involved in moving forward. Um, just talk about the, the private uh, research organizations like ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, for the last several years have looked at uh, water conservation guides and cooling for application for their uh, participants and their technical constituents. And that just came out a, about uh, a month ago on advanced cooling 
um, design guidance for power plants. It was designed and set up, I helped on that, to try and allow water managers and energy managers work together and identify um, ways that they could use alternative water resources, different cooling techniques to try and minimize water consumption. Uh, one last thing that I want to Two, two things that I want to bring up. There's also been a study done by the Department of Energy in the United States to map in the western U.S., um, the whole western U.S., water resource availability, both fresh water, brackish water, uh, wastewater, for utilization by the electric power and um, the transportation fuels industry for utilization in their processes. So there is a recognition in the western U.S., and Anna mentioned that water issues are regional. So in the whole western U.S., they, they're mapping the, the concerns and water availability, knowing that in the future, well, we're looking at using non-traditional water resources, whether that's brackish water, brackish groundwater, um, produced water from oil and gas, wastewater, as the the cooling uh, systems as a cooling uh, source for a lot of our power plants. Uh, and the last thing that I wanted to mention is uh, we're seeing that all of the research that we're doing at the national laboratories, not only in Sandia, but there are about 13 national laboratories in the United States. Many of those are uh, involved in energy research. Uh, many of them have um, programs where they look at um, water and energy uh, modeling. And we're seeing that all of the, the national labs have added water to their modeling efforts uh, when they look at energy resource and energy development. Um, used to be cost was the big driver, uh, or carbon emissions was the big driver. All of the labs that we deal with, and we made a presentation, Diego, uh, about a year ago, have, have moved forward in adding water as one of the parameters that they're optimizing for. So we're seeing now uh, moving forward as we discussed this morning um, away from a single parameter, just cost, uh, and, and looking at sustainability, and in particularly water and, and air emissions, as part of those drivers for an optimize. So, we're looking at uh, multi-parameter optimization, which is a, a new approach um, for a, a lot of uh, organizations around the world. Uh, multi-parameter optimization is rather difficult. Uh, at Sandia, we're doing syst using systems dynamics uh, tools to be able to do that. But we're seeing that water is is being asked about um, at all with all the national labs and, and the work that they're doing with their constituents, such that water becomes one of those major um, objective functions to, to drive uh, research. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Uh, I'll take a few questions if you want. Uh, hopefully what I've tried to provide is the fact that some of the work we're doing in the United States is applicable, I think, across the, the globe, that the areas that are uh, drier and are going to be more impacted by climate change are also the areas that are looking at uh, long-term economic growth. That so this this condition of matching energy with water uh, scarcity has to be looked at uh, not only in the U.S. but also worldwide. And, and hopefully, I've provided you with some ideas of how difficult it is to get momentum, um, but that if you stay with it, you can. And we're beginning to see. Uh, much of uh, the interest being being to, to accelerate this being provided by private industry because they see the, the biggest issue. And, and finally, the fact that uh, all of our modeling is moving toward including water as part of the energy portfolio evaluation suggests that this energy water nexus is real and that people are beginning to understand that and that some of these innovative uh, decision support tools and modeling approaches. These cross-sector issues really are big and do need to be considered. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for um, your excellent presentation as usual.
you know, I, I, I take away a couple of important messages. I mean, the first one is, as you said, you started seven or nine years ago. Now it seems to be picking up, so we have to be a bit uh, patient uh, ourselves, I think, because we have this impression that uh, we start a dialogue now and next year the entire world will be adopting <laughs> everything that we present here. The other one is also on, on some of the complexities. You mentioned the USGS new uh, report two years in the making. This is not that you come up with a couple of uh, quick and dirty formulas and you're done. No? It's, a, it's, it's a quite complex uh, issue to tackle. Um, I would like to open the floor for uh, some questions on, the, on, on Mike's experience. We have a deal there. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting and informative presentation. Um, I have a couple of specific questions about uh, uh, the state and the trends for uh, biofuel and uh, uh, fracking as the overall energy equation. Are they going to increase, which seems to be the trend, and, and where, where would the U.S. be in a, uh, maybe in 20, 25 years? Uh, and, and the concerns are actually a little bit wider. So, for example, for biofuel production, there's, of course, the water consumption uh, for, for irrigation. But then there's also a question about diverting land to, uh, to from, say, corn production for food to, uh, to biofuels. And there's also downstream impact. So, for example, there's a projection that the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico will increase significantly. So, in a way, the cost will be to the fisheries sector. So, they're not internal to the energy sector, but somebody else is bearing the cost for uh, greater use and production of biofuels. So how does that figure in the trend, and what, what exactly is the trend uh, going forward? Sure. You, you want my opinion, I assume, because uh, I can't talk for the federal government. But I, what I'm seeing is that um, the hydraulic fracking in the United States uh, and the fact that they're recycling a lot of the frac water and using um, l less fresh water more alternative water resources is actually accelerating fracking, not decelerating fracking, because they're getting away from some of the water constraints. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of push for natural gas, natural gas vehicles, liquefied natural gas vehicles, things like that, uh, which has taken some pressure off of the biofuels industry. And because of that, I see the biofuels industry, irrigated biofuels is, is losing market share, if you will. And I think it's going to go down because people are beginning to understand the amount of water needed for irrigated biofuels. And I think it was brought up yesterday, and we, uh, Josephina mentioned it. Irrigated biofuels is seeing more and more disfavor in the United States. Part of that's you can do that because you have natural gas. So I think that we can do more with um, recycling and natural gas, uh, the frac water, than we can. You've you got to use fresh water for irrigation. So I think the, the irrigated biofuels is, is on the downswing, and natural gas is going to continue. All right. Uh, and the irrigated biofuels will address some of the issues around the uh, – the nutrient uh, runoff that goes into the Gulf. And so I, I think that we can solve all those problems if, if we do more fracking. <laughs> okay, all right. Does that answer your question? I mean, it kind of gives you my ex see where the trends are in the United States and what I'm seeing. I'm seeing pushback in Indiana and pushback in Nebraska mm -hmm. and pushback in some of the big uh, irrigated biofuel states to, to not do more irrigation and things like that. We have Iris and, yeah, and then. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, in terms of the research budget um, and, and the research roadmap, what, how much, what's the proportion of like investment into cooling technology versus, for example, deployment of um, low water intensive um, energy sources like renewables. Um, and then the second question is, within the research of the cooling technology, 
Um, is the intention to retrofit the existing fleet or is it research into new build? It's focused on, um, uh, so I'm sh sure you're talking about the Electric Power Research Institute work or are you talking, okay. <clears throat> Let me just talk about the DOE program. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly where the DOE program is going to go. Um, the interesting thing is it's, the projections are $70 million for new money. That, that is a big program in tight budgets that they think that it's that important. I will tell you that the current Secretary of Energy for the United States is Ernie Moniz, and he's from MIT, and he was looking at energy water issues when he was at MIT. So he understands this within the United States. So I think that's why we're seeing that focus. Um, the direction that, that we see from the Department of Energy is in four areas for that research program. One is um, reduction in water use for cooling. One is reduction of fresh water use in uh, transportation fuels. The third is reducing the energy demand for water treatment because a lot of places are looking at using non-traditional water resources in the future. So, and the fourth one that they have is um, decision support tools and modeling. So it's a four-pronged approach, so they're going to address all of those. My guess is, knowing that the Department of Energy, they'll probably divide the money up equally, so $15, $20 million to each one of those areas. The advanced cooling program that EPRI has is they're really looking at game-changing technologies for new plants. And the reason for that is uh, about 75% of the power generation in the United States is is 40 years old, and those plants are in the process over the next decade or two to be um, rebuilt and replaced. So they're looking at new technologies to uh, address that currently, rather than trying to address uh, retrofits for plants. That gets to be pretty difficult to retrofit a once-through cooling plant with a, a cooling tower because of the generator systems and the condensing systems that exist. So the, the focus is on new plants, new applications. Does that answer your question? Okay. We have here now, and then Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's a very interesting presentation, uh, a lot of uh, new ideas, informations. Actually, in the, your presentation is a very good uh, in the supplementary or complementary to ANAS, because ANAS emphasizes in the regional and the site specific, you talk about the sector. And um, two questions. One question, when those kind of the study do, what is the environment impact assessment? Are they taking to the environment because of the main driver is the security, is the scarcity of water, that's why it's more in the west, in the southwest. And to what extent the environment and particularly the, on the ecosystem, on the biodiversity, on the fishery, this kind of a study has been uh, undertaken. The second question, you know, because now you know, the fracturing became so popular and so controversial, uh, not only in the U.S. and also globally, and uh, you mentioned that the private sector uh, has been taking initiative to try to address that from the government part of view. Uh, even from the think tank of the government, the DOE and others, are they thinking about, uh, you know, to advise the government to regulate or to put some standard about uh, this fracturing practice, like uh, how much chemical you used, what type of chemical you can use. So rather than just uh, leave that to private sector, that's my second question. Thank you. Okay, real quickly, let me do the fracking first. Uh, in the United States, most of the fracking issues are handled by individual states. So it's a state, uh, state control, state environment departments. And uh, what we're seeing is that there is beginning to be a general consensus by the states in how to handle uh, fracking and frack water and, and uh, what's in the fracking solutions and things like that. So. There is a, a group called the Groundwater Protection Council, which is uh, an arm of the EPA that works with the oil and gas industry. And through that Groundwater Protection Council, GWPC, 
uh, they're developing some guidelines for states for frac water utilization, uh, recycling, reuse, et cetera. So those, um, we're beginning to see uh, drives toward recycling and reuse of all frac water by most of the states. Um, dumping it into a stream or river is, is not something that people are going to do anymore. So we're seeing that move to kind of a consensus of uh, environmental standards associated with that. And uh, I think in the next four or five years, you'll see most states will have the same environmental requirements. Even though they, they, there could be 50 of them, they're all going to be about the same. And then as far as uh, the environmental issues uh, with cooling that you asked, the first question I think was, was one. Uh, most of the cooling issues uh, in the western U.S. are about scarcity. And so we're seeing, as Anna pointed out, uh, if you don't have water to consume, you, you can't consume it. But we don't have enough water to have withdrawals either. So we're seeing a lot more driving toward uh, dry cooling. Uh, hybrid cooling is probably the, the, the best approach in the West because it's hot, it's dry, there's not a lot of water. So you, you don't, you don't want to have high consumption, you don't, can't have high withdrawal. So that's not necessarily an environmental concern. It's really a scarcity concern. In the eastern U.S., where plants, have, we have, there's a lot of water, a lot more water, but there's a lot more competition, a lot of growth in the eastern U.S. We're seeing uh, the, the move toward different cooling technologies as a combination of, one, environmental issues, the, uh, the, the thermal and the impingement issues, as well as just reducing um, water consumption also. So if you look at the EPA's directions, they're suggesting to go once through cooling. What we're seeing a lot of plants doing is going, that's way too much water consumption, as Anna pointed out, and they're actually going to hybrid cooling also. So two countries in the United States, the eastern U.S. and the western U.S., a uh, big driver on scarcity is driving all the cooling research uh, in the west. The east is a combination of economics and uh, environmental. Did that answer you? Did I answer you both your questions? Okay. Thanks. Let's, uh, let's take one, maybe two more, and then uh, we have to move on. Right. Maybe they can continue with Mike in the coffee break as well. But we have Jack here and Alexander in the back. Thanks very much. Um, I, I reacted to the earlier oh, to, to, to okay. the earlier question from, from okay. Ad, Adil, or your answer to the earlier question to Adil, which struck me as being very interesting, because it brings into focus um, politics and the unintended consequences of politics. And my immediate reaction was to hear that um, the bread from heaven that the farmers thought they had of subsidised prices for uh, products to go into biofuel, uh, maybe diminishing and cleaning up the, the gulf, probably not thought of by anybody, um, but is likely to create a reaction of those farmers wanting something else to be subsidized, um, uh, which will probably have an impact on in global trade and global politics. Uh, so the strength of the, the nexus comes forward yet again, and I think it reinforces what Adil said yesterday also, that we ought to think seriously about land as a fourth dimension of the nexus. So maybe that's a comment rather than a question. But okay. uh, your reaction would nevertheless be interesting. Thank you. I don't disagree. I, I think a lot of people are looking at energy water ag, energy water land. I mean, it's, it's all natural resources sustainability, and you have to look at all the natural resources. And we, we, you know, we just look at air and climate change, and it's driven us in, in some bad directions. We've got to look at water, land, and, and food, yeah. There's one more? Yeah, Alexander, yeah. Then we, we move on. Because I can stay here for like a year, and Diego, Diego knows that. <laughs> <laughs> He's pushing me out off the podium right now. Okay. Can continue in the Thank you. I won't keep you here for a year. Just, yeah. just one question. Um, why are these industries investing so much money in uh, trying to find technologies to use less water? Is that because they're so environmentally concerned? Or, and that's my real question, um, is the price of water going up? Is that, is that what triggers them? Because water gets more scarce. How's the, the pricing arranged 
in the U.S. for water. Thank you. Yeah, water pricing is generally local, um, and so what we're seeing is that uh, if you talk about the hydraulic fracking as an example, it's uh, started out in Texas where they have certain water policies, um, which allows you to use a lot of water without having to pay a, a big price for it. Then they moved uh, toward Pennsylvania, which has a lot of water, um, and they weren't familiar with some of the water quantity issues. They didn't have a problem. Now we're seeing a lot of fracking in the western U.S., which has a scarcity of water, and you're in different states that have different water laws, and now the price of water is very expensive, and this uh, availability is very marginal. So what we've seen is the, the oil companies going, okay, uh, we either have to bring in a lot of water, it's going to cost us a lot of money, or we're going to have to recycle, reuse. And now that they've started to do that, it was by necessity that they had to do it, and they're beginning to see, oh gosh, we can, we can make this work. So uh, st they're moving into states that were anti-fracking, and the fact that their recycling has actually allowed them to open up new reserves to them. So it, it would, may be serendipity, but it really was a business case for them because they were moving into the western U.S. where they needed uh, water resources, that, and they were scarce. Uh, so instead of paying the, the extra price, it was cheaper to develop new approaches, new technologies. And I think that that's generally, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And we're seeing that that has some benefit, I think, to everybody else in the U.S. as well as worldwide on how to recycle uh, frack water and reuse that. But it was, it was an economic driver because of the scarcity of water. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mike, again. Uh, yes. Uh, you can be captured during the yeah. coffee breaks okay, and I'll lunches and dinners. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thanks again. Uh, now we move to, to Adrian Stone from um, Energy Research Center of UC, in the University of Cape Town. He's working with our team in the implementation of... Um, actually, it's, it's, it's quite interesting what he's going to be presenting because he's precisely what we, we discussed and Mike also mentioned that is happening in the U.S. is how do you incorporate potential water constraints or uh, the, the cost of bringing water to the energy sector into a real sort of energy planning uh, framework? No? So, Adrian, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, my name is Adrian, and I'm not a water expert. <clears throat> so I'm going to forgive, I'm going to ask your forgiveness for any her <coughs> heresies I might commit. Um, and I'm also going to discuss models in 10 minutes, which is always going to give a very partial picture. Um, and, but I'll try and bring out the, um, the major concepts that, that we're trying to deal with. Um, I am, well, we are partnering with water experts from a consulting company called Oricon, and you'll see James Cullis' uh, name there. And um, I have a lot of faith in the, my colleagues in the water sector in South Africa, I'm always quite humbled by their presentations and their wonderfully disaggregated models um, and yeah, I think certainly they, they always put us to shame with their skills. So I'm quite confident that we'll be well supported in this project. Uh, and this project, as Diego has mentioned before, is, is part of the World Bank's uh, Thirsty Energy Initiative. And what do we want to do? Um, it's a very energy-centered um, project in the sense we're taking an energy systems model that had very limited uh, analysis of the water situation before, and we're going to try and make this water smart. That process um, is, um, M Mike mentioned, multi-objective optimization. This is not that. This is a cost optimization model. I will mention later how you can possibly um, bring in other objectives through constraints, but it's it's not as ambitious as, as multi-parameter um, uh, optimization, but I think I'm ambitious nonetheless. And as you see, there are some complexities. Uh, where am I from? I'm from an organization within the University of Cape Town uh, called the Energy Research Center. It's an engineering faculty, and I'm from a little group in there called Energy Systems Analysis. And we m work mostly with these uh, quite high-level optimization models. They're not detailed technology models. Uh, Anna would have showed you some of the thermodynamics of 
power stations, we're not going down to that level. You'll see we deal at a, at a higher level, but it gets complex because of the size of the system. We're well supported with a multidisciplinary group. Uh, we've got an energy efficiency group and an energy and climate change group, and there are many professionals from different disciplines there that can support us engineers uh, in a multidisciplinary way. Just a little bit about South Africa. Um, the main, main feature of South Africa is, as far as, as this forum is concerned is it's quite a water scarce country. Our annual rainfall <coughs> is about half the global average, just over half. Um, and it's, water supply is quite variable over the country. You'll see uh, the second from left graph, sorry, uh, the most right hand bottom graph. Are, um, the consumption of water by the electricity sector similar to the United States, so about 2%. 2%. Um, we uh, have mostly very large coal power stations, so about 90% of capacity is large coal fired power stations of around 4 gigawatts, most of them. Um, and it's mostly closed loop cooling there. I think there are very few old open loop power stations, if any, left. And there's a move to dry cooling. So there's a recognition of the water energy nexus, and this is just driven by the water scarcity in our country, by the utility that dominates our power sector, which is called Eskom. And uh, currently, their coal power stations supply 90%, 6% of the electricity with, with coal. But we have a program that's uh, rolling out uh, renewable independent power producers, and my colleagues from Avango might mention that, that that's one of the companies that's uh, involved with that. And that should see us have 10% of uh, solar and wind uh, capacity in the near future. So we've got very small amounts of arable land cover, and that affects things like biofuels. We don't have a lot of potential for first-generation biofuels, and that's important from a modeling point of view. Uh, the emerging interest in biofuels most is mostly looking at second generation biofuels um, because we really, for food security purposes, we really can't afford the land uh, with so only 12% of our land cover suitable for, for that's essentially arable. Uh, and most of our waters, uh, again, like the United States, are allocated to agriculture. Just interesting in yesterday's discussion about the poverty line, um, you'll see 90% of the population with access to electricity. Now, that doesn't mean that they use much. And the reason for that, that uh, far left-hand graph, see low income, 42%. In fact, um, about 30% of households live on under $9 a day. Uh, and at a household size of about four or five, that, that comes down to below that $2 a day that was discussed yesterday. So a whole third of our population really live below that, below that poverty line. Um, as I said, the, there's, there's a, it's, the water energy nexus is not something that gets ignored in South Africa and hasn't been for some time. We've had dry cooled, large dry cooled power stations for decades. Um, and there's quite a, a sense of, this Salamash University, there's a sense for for design expertise of these stations that's, that's localized, of those systems. Um, and Eskom also in its annual report, uh, if you had to look at it, you see that there's a water consumption target, which they missed. Um, and interestingly, again, one of the major reasons that they missed that target was because the South African power systems under so much pressure that they couldn't shut down stations to fix leaks. So there's another complexity to the system. We're, we're consuming water because we haven't got enough reserve margin to actually fix uh, leak and cooling systems. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we've got quite a, a well-developed uh, water sector, particularly on the research side. And this is a very busy map, um, but it's really just to illustrate a principle, or two principles, in fact. And the sort of green and blue bars are a comparison of what can be supplied and what's demanded, and the red sort of shows shortfalls. And those arrows that you see are inter existing interbasin transfers and mooted interbasin transfers. And interbasin transfers have been happening for some time in South Africa. And again, because of our water scarcity, that's something that char characterizes our water system. 
And as demand grows, that's where a lot of the projects that will supply that demand are actually going to meet it through interbase and transfers, which are potentially quite costly. The other thing it illustrates, um, and the deal brought this up yesterday, and Mike again, what a the water situation is very different regionally in South Africa, and it means that there are different marginal costs of supplying water all over the country, and different costing is localized, and there's going to be, in the future, a divergence of those costs. And this is something we have to try and capture in the model, because we're running to 2050, like most planning models, so that divergence of cost is critical to getting an accurate picture of how water and the cost of water is going to affect the cost of energy. And that's a typical marginal cost curve generated uh, by our colleagues um, in the water sector. And the steps of that pyramid are different projects. And uh, as the, that line which ends in being dotted, which is demand, ratchets up, the water engineers need to install one of those pyramids. And you'll see that each pyramid is more expensive than the last. And that first Makola crocodile augment is a transfer, and so is that reuse of water from vile catchment. So that's pipelines and pumps uh, running all over the place. And uh, you end up with desalination at, at the top. So luckily for us in this project, we've already got uh, a good foundation laid by our colleagues in the, in the water sector, luckily also running to 2050, which allows us to hopefully make some estimates of what water is going to cost in different basins and what those WMAs, water management areas, which are conglomerations of basins, where our power producing infrastructure is located. The Falele, incidentally, is the, um, the water, ba water basin where Eskom's latest large dry cooled power station is located. Um, it's called Madupi. It's the largest dry cooled power station of its type in the world. It's almost five gigawatts. Um, and although it's dry cooled, it now requires water for flue gas desulfurization. And my friends who visited the site tell me there's an endless pipeline uh, that's bringing that water directly in a, in a transfer from another basin. So hopefully, with these marginal cost curves for uh, each catchment where we might uh, have our, our, our uh, power infrastructure, we can come up with an average cost against system yield, and we can work with scenarios of what water might, demand might be, not just from the, our power stations, but uh, in a supplementary modeling exercise from other demands like agriculture and domestic use. And we can also look at that. Um, Mike mentioned we're in the mid-latitude belts, as Mike showed on his map. So we are definitely subject to climate change risk. Uh, like a lot of parts of Southern Africa, it's mostly bad news. It's, it's drying out in a lot of uh, basins in South Africa, although some models will show wetting as well. So that's why there's two dotted lines there. Uh, again, this is for Lefalele. I don't think this is final. James uh, created this graph as a, a conceptual uh, Piece of work. So we've got to try and get this water information into this national energy model, and what is it? It's called SATIM, it stands for South African Times Model, and Times is a, a globally used platform for these least cost optimi op partial equilibrium, least cost optimization type models, and it's capable of representing the whole energy system, including its economic costs and its emissions. So there's critical things here, costs and emissions constraints. It's been developed for a number of years. Uh, former colleagues started it in 2003 with South Africa's first integrated energy plan. Uh, I must emphasize the model is no longer used for that purpose. Um, there's a separate model used by the Department of Energy, and we run ours in, in parallel. Um, and it's sectorally based. So we've got the electricity and, and transport sector representing quite a lot of detail because of their energy consumption and to a lesser extent, uh, smaller energy consuming sectors like the commercial sector and the agricultural sector. Um, and the methodology and its assumptions, we try to put those um, in the public domain and, and those links will take you there. Um, and 
hopefully to get public participation and, and criticism and, and improvement. So we try and make this a public model. So, you know, the main features, um, this sort of planning model, as I said, is, is long range, looking at least at 10 years, and, and in this project we'll be looking until 2050. Um, and it's an end use type model. So we, we try and look at what energy services the um, energy system needs, light, heat, passenger kilometers, and, or ton kilometers in the, in the case of, of transport, heat from boilers and then work with technologies to work out how much actual energy will be supplied. So we, we try and work in a final, is what we call a, uh, a useful energy basis, looking at, at, at services that we can supply, not so interested in quantities of energy that comes out in the model. So we need to describe the types of equipment used, how much energy is used by each type of equipment to satisfy demand. So we can forecast useful energy as well as final energy demand. The useful things we need in life, like I said, energy, at least heat, light, ton kilometers, as well as terajoules, which is a very abstract thing. And this enables us to capture uh, structural changes and shocks, disruptive technologies, fuel switches, uh, switches, mode switches. Because we're working with passenger kilometers, if you switch between modes, we're, we're not affected and a new total energy consumption will come out. And technological improvement and, and improved efficiency and also intensity changes. We have a mining driven economy. Obviously as mines dig deeper, their energy intensity goes up. So the objective is really at the end of the day to minimize the cost of supplying an energy service. And this is just a simple way. It's really about energy chains. So we've got the whole energy chain mapped out in the model, starting from primary energy, it could be coal or, or crude oil uh, mined in a rig. It gets transformed in some way, it gets transmitted, it goes to some end use and it delivers a service, and this is critical, a distance traveled or illumination or something useful. And we try and decide how much, what, what will society need of those useful things and work back to energy. So we're passing commodities along to get a useful service out. So then it, you can immediately see why couldn't water be one of those commodities. We're passing gas and coal and electricity along a chain and at every step it gets water use as well and that has costs. So there's no reason in principle why we can't just commoditize water in this model and that's really the fundamental concept here. So while the model gets complex because of we're mapping out a whole system. In principle, it's, it's simple. There's two simple components. E energy carriers, fuels, and the demand for services, and then technologies that are going to supply those services and be supplied with those fuels. But rather think of them as commodities because they could use water too. Light bulbs, power plants, um, cars that could use biofuels and so on. So there's an input and output carrier, an efficiency, in, and in investment costs, uh, activity costs, what capacity of the technology is available, uh, what its availability is because of shutdowns and so on, how, how long it's going to exist, and critically, what are its emissions. Up to now, we've had water as an emission, so we just checked the amount of water that the system was using as an emission. Now we want to change that and make it one of the carriers. And all of these things, so we only include the detail in the model that affect the cost of supplying the energy service because we're interested in, in cost. Um, we don't go to any greater amount of technological details, not an engineering model. And the whole system will be mapped out like this. We call it a reference energy system diagram. And uh, you saw the chains earlier in pictures. All these, this is now, is a series of competing chains at the far right, home space heating is the service we're supplying, and that service can be supplied by a combination of chains as commodities are passed from box to box. Gas extraction to gas plant to gas-fired power plant gives you electricity, which then can supply an electric heater, or you could just use the gas directly. So commodities are input and output from to and from technologies or on competing chains, and then water can be one of these commodities if we know enough about supply. So 
it's a question of using all of that foundational work from our water colleagues to now add to this chain. So we can have water in this reference energy system diagram essentially as well. And the, critically, the cost of water and any constraints. So if water can't be supplied in sufficient quantities to meet a certain water intensive chain, then that chain will be thrown out of the model. So we limit, we're only looking at cost, but we can constrain quantities. We can say no more than certain amounts of megaliters can be supplied in this district um, or overall in this part of the model. So we're obviously going to look at, at certain scenarios, um, optimizations with and without water costs. So we're going to contrast the situation we had before and then see, well, what does introducing all of these costs do? That's a logical thing to do. I showed you the water cost impacts of climate change. The next step is to say, well, what do climate change scenarios do to that situation? How extreme can they make it? Um, and then greenhouse gas constraint scenarios. So contrasting a, a 275 megaton cap, uh, probably coming down to 220 megatons by 2050, which is really the sort of official uh, target of the country, uh, with CO2 tax options. Um, so we've got a whole CO2 tax process going on in South Africa at the moment, and there's all sorts of horse trading and excitement and skullduggery, as you can imagine, on that. And it's timeless because the, you know, the first uh, proposed uh, tax options have, have been made and they're going to be unfolding while we're doing the project. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to try those out in the model. Um, so now, I've talked mostly about the power sector, but fracking did come up and uh, there's large shale gas deposits have been identified and of, interestingly in a semi-desert area of South Africa. And <clears throat> the surveying work is starting. It's going to take about 10 years to survey the field. But really, uh, the, the, we've got a Water Research Commission in, in South Africa that are very active, and their CEO spoke at the university recently, and his comment was, really, if, the, if that resource is viable, it's going to happen. So South Africa is going down that fracking route, and that's really driven by a developmental economy. And his comment was, the best that we can hope for from a, from a water point of view is that this thing gets done to the highest possible standard. Um, so given, given resource availability, it's a very, very likely outcome in South Africa. And we, we're gonna, it is in our model now, and we're going to augment that and try and look at the, uh, at the water consumption of that in more detail. And, and Mike's comments on um, alternative water supplies were obviously very interesting for us in, in that regard. Just as a... I think it's always good to talk about the shortcomings of models. Um, they're always limited, and that's going to be my last comments. Um, demand is exogenous to our model, so there's no demand response um, unless we, we, we've got a, a price elasticity for each end use. So um, the model's not responding to any changes in prices that are happening within the model. So it's very much, uh, I use the word partial equilibrium. It's an equilibrium with itself. It's not, in, we don't have a general equilibrium with the rest of the economy. So we're doing stuff in the model that might affect the economy, but we're not seeing those impacts. But Diego mentioned a phase two yesterday, and at the moment what we're trying to do is we link to a comp computational general equilibrium model that's an economy-wide model and pass information and iterate between the two. So that might be a, a phase two later where... where um, we look at, at what the effects of, of including uh, of the effects on knock-on effects to water and, and energy have on the greater economy and then feed back into our model. It is actually already a water smart CGE model. Um, so and as I, just, as I said before, times it's about broad technical economic planning questions. There's not a lot of engineering or, or econ economic detail. So we're quite reliant on the quality of the microanalysis we do, for instance, in projecting that exogenous demand. But you won't see the, that microanalysis in the, in the final product. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's, um, that's uh, all I want to say right now, and I'll, I'll take some questions if, if there are. Hey, thank
Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, well, for us, I'm being biased, but it's quite an interesting exercise. Uh, pretty new, I think, in the in the field, at least from the water side, but even from the energy side. I mean, we've heard also from Mike that it's quite recently that they started incorporating uh, water constraints and, and other things. I think we, if we have time, it's only for one question before we break. You know, then we can, I guess, we can discuss uh, during the coffee break. Is, shall we do a, afterwards? A, is it a 15-minute uh, coffee break, Josefina? Or yeah? That's, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I do think do I, we I, have one question or any pending question, burning issues yeah, before I, the break? I, I'm going to take my role as master of ceremonies here now. And, You're the master and of I ceremonies. think I think it's fine. Uh, yeah, I think we can have one question, but we are half an hour late. And okay. I think, uh, you know, just to make sure that we keep it on time, because otherwise the next So I'm a worse uh, manager than you are. Yeah. Yesterday you were like 10 minutes late. It's okay. No questions? Okay, I guess we can go to the coffee break then. And if, if you have any questions, uh, just grab uh, Ad Adrian, who is there. Uh, we resume in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Thank you.